Good evening, everybody, and a, a very warm welcome to Claire for this, the first in our series of 50th anniversary lectures, marking the half century of co-education at this college. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, um, who, of course, needs little introduction, perhaps, to a Clare audience, um, but for whom it is my not only pleasure, but privilege to count as a friend as well as a colleague. Um, Polly O'Hanlon was one of that pioneering generation of Clare women who came up in 1972, the first year of co-education. And like many of that pioneering generation has gone on to immense distinction, but in Polly's case, not just in one field, but in a number. Uh, Polly in 1999 became this college's first female senior tutor, uh, a role which she filled with immense distinction. Um, amongst her many accomplishments during that time was really kick-starting the college's school's liaison programme to widen participation uh, and increase access uh, to the college for students from less advantaged backgrounds. Um, and it was indeed in that guise that Polly and I first uh, were partners in crime uh, all those years ago. Um, but Polly is so much uh, more than uh, just a former senior tutor. She's also an extremely distinguished historian of modern India. <laughs> Uh, and in that guise, um, in 2007, um, became the Professor of Indian History and Culture at the University of Oxford. Um, and indeed, in recognition of her academic prowess, was elected a Fellow of the British Academy uh, in 2020. Um, since stepping down from the chair in Oxford, um, Polly has returned to Cambridge and Oxford loss is very much Cambridge's gain. Um, it's an absolute delight, Polly, to have you back here amongst us where you are uh, always welcome. You are part of the Clare family and gosh, you have earned that moniker more than most people. Um, and we're particularly delighted that you're here to kick off our 50th anniversary uh, with a talk, Clare at 50, hope and experience in a post-feminist age. Polly, over to you. Well, thank you everyone for coming and I'm very grateful to the college for giving me the chance to reflect on our celebration of 50 years since Claire took in women. Um, and I'd also just like to take this uh, moment to thank uh, the, the friends and colleagues um, who, who shared their ideas with me in, in trying to uh, develop um, uh, a talk for this evening. I must admit though to some trepidation. There have been many occasions over the decades when we marked anniversaries of the event, we made speeches, we retailed our recollections and generally felt enormously thankful to that generation, of the uh, that generation of the college's fellows, far-sighted enough to come together behind the change. So we might ask ourselves, what more is there to be said? Well, perhaps the first and most obvious thing is just how long ago it was now. The world before 1948, when women were first admitted to full membership of the university, seems even longer ago. In the decades before that, fellows and students alike took to the streets in boisterous mockery of the women from Girton and Newnham who hoped actually to be awarded degrees uh, for the exams that they had sat. You can see some images of the male outrage here in the slide. You can see the effigy um, of the woman student it's over there, um, uh, the woman student dressed in immodest pantaloons and trying to ride a bicycle um, here dangling from the corner of what is now the Cambridge University bookshop on the corner of Trinity Street. Full membership of the University for Women wasn't to come until 1948 and the first female member pictured here in the procession um, uh, was the eminently respectable queen, or as we now know, came to know her, the queen mother. Such images seem to belong to another world entirely. Still, 50 years is a long time, before the internet, before social media, before mobile phones. It was when students living in Memorial Court 
had to queue up to make a call at the red phone box on Queen's Road, which is still there, um, anxiously counting our shillings. This was the era still of exchange controls, when the weakness of sterling meant that HM government dictated how many pounds you were allowed to take out of the country on holiday, and you had to write it in your passport, which you can see there. It was the era still of empire, when British troops were only just withdrawing from their military bases, you can see here in the headline, their military bases in Southeast Asia when the Shah of Iran and his glamorous wife was still a welcome visitor to these shores. And of course, the war in Vietnam was still entering its final bitter years. For women, the invention of the contraceptive pill was a rather recent um, and controversial event. The early dispensers rather charmingly made, as you can see here, in the shape of a woman's compact, how convenient um, and how appropriately feminine. Our arrival in the college was just two years after the 1970 election, which brought Edward Heath's Conservative government to power, with, of course, Mrs Thatcher as Education Secretary. This was the first election uh, in which the voting age had been reduced to 18, and you can see uh, here um, a, a young woman uh, enjoying the privilege. It was also, of course, the age of terrible haircuts and <laughs> immense flared trousers. <laughs> um, looking around just at the moment, of course, you might be forgiven for thinking that we have in inadvertently entered some harrowing time loop which has returned us unexpectedly to the 1970s <laughs> to rampant inflation tick a collapse in the currency tick arguments about the european union tick widespread industrial unrest tick university sit-ins tick threats of extra of electricity blackouts tick and even for those of you given to musical revivals the return in extraordinarily lifelike virtual form of the ABBA band of the 1970s. <laughs> but no, it really has been 50 years. I should also add that reflection on the anniversary is a difficult task for me, because until 2007, I spent almost all of my working life attached to Claire. I was undergraduate, postgraduate, junior fellow, teaching fellow, tutor, and eventually senior tutor, after which it seemed wise to move discreetly eastwards to another university. It's hard, I think, in such a situation to disentangle your own sense of the trajectory of your life from that of the institution itself, to separate the long-term from the short-term, individual memory from broader social change. Looked at in the longer term, the admission of women into Oxbridge colleges now looks rather a footnote in the wider story of enlargement of higher education opportunities, something that was really inevitable. But of course it was in its own way, and in the experience of students at the time, momentous. For people of my generation in particular, it's very much a mirror into which we look to come to, sort of, to, come to some sort of judgment as to what we made of our time and how things have changed since. 50 years is of course also an occasion for celebration and thankfulness to the many predecessors who worked so hard to make the admission of women possible and to support us whilst we were here. But it's also an occasion which brings home to us how fragile are the gains here and across the world for gender equality. So, let me go back to 1972 and subsequent early years in the college. What was it like? It's worth emphasizing then, as now, that there was no single typical woman's experience. For some of those in the early 1970s, it was one long glorious party. For others, a three-year ordeal and a great many shades of experience in between. And of course, a whole host of factors shape student experience, many of them very little to do with the immediate college environment. But looking back, some common features do seem to me to emerge. 
When in the Lent term of 1970, the college took the decision to accept women, the fellows had already conducted a good deal of research into going co-educational. A small number of women, themselves also pioneers, were added to the fellowship. The new women students had male tutors, but a female tutor available if they wished to see one. They were accommodated on three neighboring staircases in Memorial Court, appropriately and luxuriously furnished. Oh dear, excuse me. Um, appropriately and luxuriously furnished, as you can see um, up there. Um, uh, and um, uh, their furnishings included the infamous full length mirrors, which caused our male contemporaries much amusement and some annoyance. Um, we had a sewing room. <laughs> soft loo paper um, um, and the benches in the hall were rearranged so that we would be able to get in and out comfortably. These photographs of Claire from that time make it look rather a gaunt and comfortless place but to us it seemed spacious and dignified and absolutely miraculous that we had in many cases entire sets to ourselves. There was an incredibly warm welcome from the fellows with their wives brought in to the matriculation drinks so that the 38 or so new women students wouldn't feel too outnumbered. There was also a largely enthusiastic reception from the pre-72 male students. Many had come from a mixed educational background and found the single sex makeup of the college very much a backwards their two-thirds vote in favour of going mixed had been a key factor in achieving the consensus on the college's governing body to change the statutes. But very much with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that there were limitations in the understanding of what going mixed meant. It's an issue we've become very familiar with these days in a variety of contexts. It's difficult to change institutional cultures quickly and particularly those that are themselves part of a large and internally complex organization like the university. I don't think many of us had a clear sense of the spaces in, in the college as in different ways gendered spaces, the JCR, the hall, the buttery, the boat club, the pavilion at Bentley Road. Much was done to the physical environment, of course, the installation of women's loos, better lighting, more comfortable furnishing. Spaces were cleared, equipment provided for women's court sports. Within a couple of years, the boat club was uh, fielding women's eights. Music was a standout area too, with the launch of Cambridge's first mixed voice choir right from 1972. But what makes spaces gendered isn't just their shape and their history, but also the people in them. While the men were welcoming, some were a little too much so, and the pursuit of newly admitted women rather a form of sport. It required some confidence to assert a presence in the JCR, particularly in those very early years when women were such a small proportion of the student body. Modes of academic discourse were also gendered, in part because almost all of the supervisors were men, and what many seemed to value was the confident exposition of an argument. Supervisions, of course, offered a wonderful opportunity for one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one learning, but the weight of expectation could also be quite challenging. Consent wasn't something we consciously thought about, um, at least in the circles I moved in. Those were times of growing sexual freedom, of course, and it would have been a brave academic who would have ventured to offer the students advice about everyday sexual conduct. Respect for freedom and privacy were certainly more important. At any rate, we were assured in an early meeting that the college had no intention of policing what we decided to do in our own rooms. Out in public, there was no me too moment. Encounters with excessively friendly teaching staff across the university were a matter of private embarrassment, or at most shared in appalled whispers with close friends. So in that very first year or two, I think there was under the surface quite a high proportion of personal difficulty among the women, 
who turned to their friends, their tutors, to sympathetic directors of studies, to the counselling service, and who struggled with a quiet sense of isolation. It's hard to see how these difficulties could have been avoided, given the social climate we lived in and the time it took to accumulate sufficient women in the college and the wider university to make things seem normal. What was remarkable, actually, was rather the speed, the uneventfulness with which the change, on the surface at least, seemed to us to happen. Testimony, of course, to the immensely hard work done in preparation for our arrival. Other things from those times are also clearer in retrospect. Women, of course, weren't the only minorities in Clare, although we received almost all of the attention. Clare in the 1970s proved a refuge for a number of extremely far-sighted and distinguished academics who had left apartheid South Africa. Uh, Charles Feinstein, who became senior tutor in 1969, Colin Turpin, the college's long-serving teaching fellow in law, and of course, Bob Heppel, who as a young man had made himself very unpopular with the South African authorities by assisting with Nelson Mandela's legal defense and so made his way to Cambridge and to Clare. Over the years, the college had drawn in a very small number of black students, just 19 between 1916 and 1973. But in 1971, from 1971, three remarkable black students arrived uh, Dapo Ladimeji, Anthony Apia, and Skip Gates, who have gone on to become leading black intellectual voices in the United States. It wasn't until 1978 that the first black woman was admitted to the college to read medical sciences. But I don't recall any very strong sense of connection between the women as relative newcomers and these students of color. If we were small in number, they were even smaller. And even though there was a limited but very active community of black students across the university, we didn't associate, at least in my own recollection, the challenges they faced with our own. There was also some disconnect with other communities with whom we might have demonstrated better fellow feeling. Claire alumni Matthew Paris and Nigel Warner, both of whom came up in the late 1960s, later 1960s, have in different ways and fields, taken a leading role in the support of LGB, LGBTQ plus causes, but have since described their difficulties and sense of isolation, not just in the college, but in the wider university. Decriminalization in 1967 marked, of course, a vital legal challenge, a change, <laughs> but it was only part of just the beginning of the long struggle to transform social attitudes. As I describe this sense of disconnect and at times isolation, I hear some of you asking, but what about the student radical movements of those days? Did these not offer Amelia in which common causes might have been developed? The 1970s were a famously lively period for student protest. There was the Garden House Riot of 1970, when students objected furiously to the presence in Cambridge of representatives of the then Greek military junta. As the colonels dined in the Garden House Hotel, clashes between student protesters and the police led to violence, damage to the hotel, and several students uh, were jailed. From 1972, attention moved to internal affairs in the university and a whole series of sit-ins over faculty reforms and government proposals to limit the autonomy of student unions. Vietnam, Northern Ireland, apartheid South Africa were also important causes. But perhaps predictably, these very vocal protests about such important global issues seemed almost to make it harder to develop a nuanced discussion of gender equality closer to home, often amongst rather diffident women, as well as men students newly arrived in Cambridge. There were also, of course, active feminist movements across the city and the university. Their agendas very much a focus of concern at the time. 
the Cambridge University Women's Action Group, which took in women's issues across the board. The Nursery Action Group, uh, whose banner uh, you can see um, here, just at the top of the picture, the, uh, the, um, the Nursery Action Group, campaigns for wages for housework, for women's refuges, and even as you can see here, by local mothers objecting to King's exclusion of pushchairs from the grounds. <laughs> this should perhaps have been more propitious material for anxious women students looking for allies in the struggle for gender equality. As we look back though, what's striking is that though the issues were vital and continuing in their relevance, the language was very much of its time. For us in our present day, gender equality takes in a much broader range of identities, issues and causes, which more actively problematize gender identity than was perhaps the case in the 1970s. In particular, they were in those days were less concerned than we are now with questions of uh, intersectionality. That's to say, thinking about gender equality across different cultures, classes, generations, and indeed gender identities themselves. We now live in a world where these things, where these matters are much more up for debate, where gender is no longer one of two things in any simple sense, and where for many it's an issue of deep personal identity which might express itself in many ways. It's this shift, of course, which has led us to think of our present time as a post-feminist age. That doesn't mean, of course, because this is a, a common misunderstanding, it doesn't mean, of course, that feminist concerns are no longer necessary and important. Rather, it's a recognition of the fact that the feminist agendas of the 1960s and 70s need to be broadened to take in these wider issues. As I think we all know, this is challenging, both in practice and in debate, because it takes time, reflection, and the search for, co for common ground to develop models of gender identity that are both socially inclusive and generous in spirit. But over time, what seems to be remarkable is how far these older feminist agendas have now blended uh, together in the college uh, with these newer approaches. Not just the college, of course, but across the UK's universities more widely. We do see much argument about what has really changed since 1972, and in older colleges like Clare, there is certainly an impression of timelessness, which for many is part of its deep appeal. Yet anyone with even a passing acquaintance with the college will know how far reaching the changes in the field of gender equality have been. As elsewhere in the student world, these changes have come slowly and many as a consequence of events in the wider world. The AIDS, AIDS crisis of the 1980s, the experiences of recession and unemployment, the strain of rising fees and declining financial support, and of course the meteoric and utterly transformational rise of the internet and social media. For me, it's the generous solidarities of the college's student that are so students that are so striking now. It's there in the absence of social pretension and avert social competitiveness. It's there in the conviction um, that gender equality has to take in ethnicity, class and generation as well as a more capacious form of gender identity than we ever envisaged in the 1970s. It's there in the many roles um, for uh, concerned with equalities uh, outlined on the UCS website, and I hope the UCS will forgive me for reproducing uh, uh, part of their website. Um, uh, I just I thought it was striking how equalities is such a prominent part of it. Uh, it's there, um, widening participation to student me mental health, from BMA, BMAE is issues to student hardship, to the challenges of disabled students in the college. It's there also in the generous enthusiasm with which Clare students has helped, have helped lead the college's search for talent in schools and parts of the country with little tradition of applying to Cambridge. 
It's there in the culture of charitable fundraising amongst our students for bursaries in particular. It's there in a wide range of other activities from environmental initi uh, initiatives to the periodic charitable work of the choir. The last area in our post-feminist age that I'd like to think about lies in the social profile of our students. Some have expressed the concern that the, that the admission of very able women, many from comfortable professional families, may have reduced opportunities for young men from families with little experience of university education. It's very difficult to get statistics for the UK's leading universities, but I certainly remember what seemed to be a more diverse social media in the early 1970s, particularly in the very much stronger regional accents that I remember vividly from my time as an undergraduate. But academic literature tells us that we are all much more middle class now, and so perhaps that may explain my impression. There's, there is, of course, evidence of a contraction of opportunity during the 1980s, no doubt associated with the severe recession of that decade. From the 1990s, though, the general expansion of higher education in the UK, of course, changed the environment enormously, with the 1992 abolition of the distinction between universities and polytechnics in particular. In uh, 1972, just 9% of young people went to university. Uh, the figure is nearly 45% now. Nevertheless, it's well established that families who already have a history of higher education have in fact been in the best position to benefit from this expansion, particularly in leading universities. And it's against this background that the university and the colleges have put such enormous effort into widening participation and increasing financial support for students. And Claire has been right at the forefront of this effort. In the 1990s and with great trepidation, the college invited a journalist from the Guardian newspaper to sit in on its entire admissions process in order to make it more transparent. Working with the Sutton Trust, the college built on its older history of association with deprived communities in East London to establish an outreach link. And of course, a huge effort has gone into fundraising for bursaries. Some 33% of all Clare students now receive some form of bursary support. So what can we reasonably celebrate after these 50 years? What, if anything, can we learn from the experience of that long trajectory? And what might we yet hope for? What we celebrate is surely the foresight and courage of the 1960s generation of fellows, but surely also the remarkable solidarities of our present generation of students. These forms of comradeship and social conscience I do think are in some part the good legacy of that early value placed on, placed on the importance of making the college a more inclusive association. We also celebrate the potential of the oldest institutions to change, even if the process is slow and often contentious. And what about experience? The challenges faced by those who go first are often underestimated at the time and just experienced privately as private difficulty. Only later, with hindsight, does it become clear that such experiences were bound up with long-term social change. I mention this not because I was one of those students of 1972 wearing tremendous flares and sporting a terrible haircut. I mention it rather because our student community of the present also pioneers. Pioneers of the age of social media, with all of the enormous pressures and opportunities that they entail, and pioneers at the same time of learning during a global pandemic. The hope must be now that such challenges are no longer experienced just as private difficulty, but very much as a, collect a collective concern among, amid a very strong network of student support. Thank you.
Holly, thank you so much. And before we move to questions um, <clears throat> from the audience, it's my great pleasure to introduce Hannah Fitch, who is a current graduate student at Clare, who is going to have a dialogue with Polly, exploring some of the themes uh, from her talk. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you, Polly. Um, I had the privilege of reading Polly's talk yesterday ahead of you, so I've had some previews and it's been fascinating to start that conversation with you yesterday and to continue it now today with all of us here. Um, I first wanted to pick up on your sense that you shared with us at the, the very beginning of your talk that 50 years is a very long time ago. Um, and I understand that and thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I also wanted to share, as I have spoken with peers and with family, um, the, about the fact that we're celebrating 50 years of women at Clare, their reaction has first been to say, wow, that's amazing that you get to celebrate that, followed by a thoughtful pause, followed by saying, but 50 years isn't really very long. And I think in that is a sense of um, the amount of change yet to come, and also a sense of how long it takes for change to um, happen. So I wonder if you first wanted to comment a little bit more on that. Uh, thanks, Hannah. Um, well, of course, um, our, our experience of time is subjective. Um, some things seem to take an immensely long time, even though they, they may be only um, a minute or two. Some things go by in a flash, you know, particularly when we are enjoying ourselves. Um, so um, uh, I think there's a, there's a kind of personal perspective, a subjective experience of the passage of time. There is also, of course, um, and here again, um, your, uh, the age that you are um, affects the, um, the way that you experience the passage of time. And as you get older, time seems to you to go more and more quickly. But I also think it is a phenomenon of our own times that technolog technological change in particular means that our sense of the passage of, all of our senses of, of change, of the passage of time, have immensely speeded up. Things that used to move in a kind of glacial way now, you know, five years ago, God, that's ages. You still have that. Look at your mobile phone. God, it's enormous. Yeah, you know. So the way that we measure time uh, um, is very much a reflection, I think, of the huge speed up in, our, in, in, in change that new technologies have, have brought to us. Um, but I think, um, I mean, for me, 50 years does feel, for all sorts of reasons, does feel a long time. And it clearly, even in the life of a very ancient institution like this one and the wider university, it may be a relatively short period of time, but in the life of an individual um, and even in the life of, of generations, um, it is a long time and so very much worth, um, worth our pausing to reflect um, what's been achieved um, in that time. It seems to me a good idea to have some sense of accounting, you know, when you get to your 50th anniversary. Um, so that was partly what I hoped to offer this evening. I wonder as well if there's something in that about the transience of student communities um, and how that affects change in a smaller institution where mm. people are coming in and coming out quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned in your talk um, that facilities and buildings changed as women arrived at Clare. Um, but it's not just the facilities that make the change, it's the people. Mm -hmm. um, so with those two dynamics of mind, what, what effect does that have on our sense of time and change? Well, I, for me, the, the chief effect it, that it has is actually to make change more difficult. Um, uh, for the reason that um, uh, the entire student population of the college changes. <laughs> Um, every at the most every six years. Well, if you if you, uh, if you assume that some people, good folks like Hannah, who start out as an undergraduate here and then may complete three or even more graduate he years here, 
um, Hannah may stay, stay here for seven years. Most people stay three or four. So when people um, ask us, and, and they, they do me sometimes, and sometimes you read about it, you know, but, but the place, you know, why does it take so long for the place to change? Well, um, we are used to inst institutional cultures being difficult to change, but the particular institutional culture that we have is so dependent on the personal interests of students themselves. Um, you know, those of you who are students will all understand, you know, you come in, you have a particular passion, you work really hard during your three or four years here to get something going, whether it's to do with the environment or to do with um, uh, uh, minority issues, um, to do with um, uh, refugees. <coughs> and when you leave, you hope to be able to hand that work on to someone else, but maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, so um, change is also difficult to develop, I think, in Amelia where that there is such a rapid turnover of the population. When that's something often that I think we don't adequately consider, um, you know, given that change within the college has to come, um, I think primarily from the students. You know, I mean, you may, but perhaps that's right, perhaps, perhaps it's not right. Perhaps the fellows and the students are partners in change. But given how, how much of a turnover there is inevitably, in the student body, um, uh, our partners change very quickly, <laughs> if, you, if I can put it like that. So I think that's one of the ways uh, um, that perspective, I think, helps us to understand how difficult it can, how, how halting the process of change sometimes seems to be in an, insti you know, in, in an, uh, an institution of higher education. And what about the students that were here at the time when you first came up to Clare in 1972? Um, you mentioned some of the, the reactions, particularly of male students, as you all arrived at Cambridge. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that for us? Um, as you can imagine, there was, um, there was an, an enormous range of response. Some were very grumpy because they thought we were going to dilute the quality of the various sports teams. <laughs> um, some were, were um, in, a, in a, a boisterous and usually perfectly um, sort of charming way, um, seeing whether we were sort of up to the, you know, up to the challenge of, you know, walking confidently into the JCR when it was mainly full of chaps. Um, and, you know, mostly we were, but not always. Um, and um, I think the, what that experience really brings home um, is the importance of critical mass. Um, however, um, however well-intentioned, however welcoming, however understanding and insightful a, a, particular, a particular population may be, if in one vital um, aspect, none of them are like you, or very, very few of them are like you, it does it does cause difficulty. It, it's harder to flourish. It's harder to um, to develop your abilities. It's harder to speak up in seminars. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, that aspect of things you will appreciate was very rapidly overcome because in in 1972 there were some, I think it's 38, maybe a few fewer um, students in a community of about of, of over 400 men. And so we kind of, for me at least, we kind of disappeared. You know, I would walk around thinking, I, was, I thought there were supposed to be some women in this place. Mm -hmm. And no doubt there were other rather isolated women walking around thinking, thinking that. Um, uh, I think my experience was shaped by the fact that I am not a joiner. Um, uh, I, I remember thinking in hindsight that had I um, been a person of faith, had I been musical, um, or had I been sporting, um, I would have had a much more ready-made social <coughs> life, a much more ready-made community, mixed community of people who did things like I did. But I, I was not a joiner. You know, I, I, uh, I had interests and hoped to make friends and, and, uh, and did so. But there wasn't a kind of, re there was not a ready-made community for me to join. And so I think at the time I wondered whether, 
I hadn't been, wouldn't have been rather wiser to go to one of the women's colleges where you didn't have to join anything to find people like yourself. Um, so I, that's my sense of, uh, I think of that. Yes, thank you. That's something um, I can relate to. I think many of us in this room can still relate to that sense of being outnumbered in a room. Mm -hmm. um, I think you used in one of your anecdotes the word outnumbered um, when speaking about the fellows that invited their wives um, to mm -hmm. matriculation drinks yes. um, so that you weren't outnumbered, which is a, a great kind of gesture and show of support mm -hmm. and welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have been in those rooms where uh, at a theology dinner in my first year, there were 15 people, three of whom were women. Mm. Um, and on the seating plan, the three of us, all first years, were spread out down the table. And we often joke that that was to kind of give an impression of diversity across the group. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't imagine that was the reason, but that's what we've often joked. Um, and so that is something that's still very present to us. Um, and particularly as a postgrad, I see that as well. Um, and especially in a my research is a New Testament, which is traditionally quite a male discipline too. And so mm -hmm. I think, um, again, that sense of there is still work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, there's still change that is happening and coming. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in that, realizing that 50 years was not a very long time ago is quite reassuring to me. It tells me that we're still in the the turning of the tide and it's okay when you feel like you're outnumbered mm -hmm. um, or hitting up against things that mm -hmm. that make you notice your difference yes. um so just to share a little bit of that with you too mm -hmm. um did you want to say anything more on that dynamic of being outnumbered in particular um only that it does you know there is an upside as you would have experienced and many of you here will have experienced it does teach you a kind of resilience you know, you, you can't, you have to go out there and, you know, there's no, sitting at the back of the room, not saying anything is just the absolute worst, worst thing for your, your kind of intellectual morale um, uh, that you can possibly imagine. Um, and so I always say to, you know, with wearying, <laughs> wearying frequency to students now that it is a great mistake to come away from a seminar without having said anything. You, know, you should go in and, and, and make sure that you add your voice. <clears throat> so it, it teaches you some, <clears throat> excuse me, some resilience. Um, uh, uh, it helps you understand the dynamics of rooms rather better than you might otherwise. Um, uh, but it, it, reflecting on it also makes one think that, you know, the tide has turned and is gratifyingly come in, coming in. But, you know, what we, must all, what we must all remember is that tides also turn and go out again. And so protecting the gains that we have made in the area of gender equality is, is, uh, is very important for us to do. Uh, we, we, we mustn't assume that they're permanent because as, as we have seen across the pond in recent months, imagine 50 years ago now, a change that was brought in has now uh, now appears to be disintegrating. Um, so, yes, I think the words resilience stuck out to me there, and courage as well as another one that springs to mind, particularly in this context of protecting the gains. Um, mm -hmm. you use the word fragile to to describe those gains in your talk, and I think fragility and resilience. Um, if you're at the sculpture unveiling, we yes, talked a little about. I thought about. Yeah, I thought this is very about good. that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, both that strength and fragility that comes with change. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are two things I'll be taking away with me. Um, before we go to open Q and A, mm -hmm. um, you use the word hope, particularly towards mm -hmm. the end of your reflection, the mm -hmm. end of your talk, um, and use that in connection with. Um, intersectionality and mm. solidarity. Mm. Um, would you like to say uh, a few more words about that? Well, um, uh, I think it has to be a given um, that my freedom um, cannot come at the, the, at the expense of other people's freedoms in any simple way. Um, gains in equality have to be gains for everybody or they mean very little. Um, and so finding ways of making, of building a sense of comradeship, of finding common ground, um, of, uh, of developing common goals, even in really very unpropitious um, settings, 
uh, seems to me very important. Um, and again, something which um, uh, it, it may not be adequately, or well, I'm sure it's, of course, it's appreciated. In the age of social media, um, as we all know, people increasingly only talk to people who think like them, unless they're particularly careful to make sure that their news feeds you know, draw on a broad range of things. Um, you know, in my day, as, as your one's elderly aunt used to say, we used to speak to everybody. Um, and we did, we, um, we read, you know, the, the newspaper was the public square. Um, so you were exposed to a very wide range of views. Um, you grew up in a, an environment where many voices were there, were heard. And so you kind of got used to looking for common ground. Of course, some, some viewpoints were ridiculous. Some were very much there to be challenged, but you heard them. Um, uh, and it seems to me, um, uh, it is a challenge for building that, that essential sense of solidarity um, and, and generosity uh, in solidarity. Um, it is a challenge, uh, social media seem to me a seems to me a challenge, seems to me to make it more difficult. Um, of course, it makes it much easier to make alli alliances, but if they are only ever with people like you, whether it's your personal interests or your age or your ethnicity or your class, or, or whatever, um, that, that kind of narrowing, that sort of turning in on yourself as, as a collective makes intersectionality more difficult, I think. Um, I mean, that, I think that's just a, more or less, that is not a profound observation. It's a commonplace that you will read, I think, in any newspaper discussion of the consequences of social media. Um, so perhaps the hope that you see is the hope of solidarity and difference. Yes, yes, the hope that, that, that people will see, um, will see the value of reaching out beyond their own, um, their own particular groups, their own particular news feeds, their own particular uh, sets of interests to try and build up these alliances. Mm -hmm.